Hey guys, Harv here, and welcome back to Space Tourism. This is the Kerbal Space Program series in which I take celebrity and really quite wealthy Kerbals out to the far reaches of the solar system. In the previous episodes, we've declared that we're starting a new base, and yet, for some reason, we are still mucking about on the old one. In today's episode, we're going to be attempting to recover Matt Kerman. Now, Matt Kerman is currently stranded, if you remember, in his SSTO, which is now partially broken and almost out of fuel, on an island just below the equator, with his two friends, who were as a result of impromptu actions by their commander, stranded aboard his craft. So, of course, we need to go rescue him, because Matska Kerman is quite an important person in the KSB community. The other two Kerbals can fend for themselves. They weren't tourists, I don't think. They were just engineers, pilots, test pilots, whatever, which means they signed a contract saying that anything that happens to them is at their sole discretion, and they are not liable to claim for it. So... What can we do this episode? I seem to remember in the previous episode saying something like, a good episode is when you pull all your assets together. You know, and you you do and combine lots of different things that you've made in previous episodes and you use them all for one purpose. Well, how about this? This is the legendary Lathebound Mark I, which is featured inadvertently in almost every single episode. Because when it landed, bringing Jebediah Kerman, the original founder of the lathe base, to his destination here, it broke. It actually works fine, there's a bit of fuel in it, there's engines and everything, they are together fine. But the energy generation is completely bust, because it was settled on the undercarriage of the plane, and so broke when we closed the landing gear. Maybe we could make use of this almost fully functioning plane. It would be far easier to build a drop pod and then go find Matt Kerman and boost him off and send him to Val, which, where he, which is where he eventually needs to go. But we could make it much more interesting by trying to use this plane to help with that. So, how do we fix the plane? Well, first thing first is to get some energy to him, which is what you've just seen me build. However, when I try and build and what we will be doing for the next, uh, for the next 10 minutes, roughly, is building him a little probe fuel tank engine body thing to actually deliver this energy generation to the plane, you'll see various different iterations. So, this is the first one. Simply a fuel tank with some engines around it, with a bit more fuel tops and parachutes. And the very first test doesn't go particularly well because I launch, launch all the parachutes at the same time. It is, however, mildly entertaining. So yes, the first idea is to use some sort of sky crane contraption to land this energy generation, and indeed this entire fuel tank, on top of the plane. The only way we can do anything to Lathebound to help it is through the docking port you see just situated there on the top. Now we, lo we load up the entire launch stage onto the space plane runway, and we just detach this top part, burning the engines and opening the landing gear in order to bring it down steadily on the runway just parallel with the launch pad. And whilst we're doing that, we shall try and emulate the situation that Lathebound is currently in. Now when we landed, the reason we closed the landing gear was because we forgot to put a ladder on this thing. And so in order for Jebediah Kerman to get out and have a chance of getting back in, we had to close the landing gear before he left. Unfortunately, we didn't really have to because we did in fact have a pro body. And we do in fact have a pro body on this plane right now. So, whatever the case, we try and emulate the situation it's currently in by closing the landing gear and thus reducing its height up off the ground, because this is how it is currently sitting. And it is also sitting on fairly level ground, so you may say that as a simulation this isn't going to be particularly fair because this is in a very controlled environment, but it isn't, it isn't too different, actually. It isn't too... Not, it isn't far off what we shall actually be encountering on lathe. There are a few key differences, though. But, leaving that for now, we carry on with our mission to build the ultimate custom refueler. Trying to uh, do so, however, is slightly difficult, especially when you're recording late at night. Yes, indeed, this was recorded in the early hours of the morning, just after having eaten in the early hours of the morning, and now we're going to try and use this craft which I've bolted some struts-like legs onto 
to actually dock with this thing. Unfortunately, you can see that as first attempts go, this one isn't particularly great. I mean, it has got over here. With the use of parachutes and its engines, it has managed to get remarkably close to the plane, and in fact, it will get to all the way on top of the docking port. However, what we want is for not only it to be on top of the docking port, we actually need it to be docked, you know? That might slightly help, maybe? I mean, what we can do is just detach this here, and lovely jubbly, that energy generation module will slot down directly on top. But that isn't the end of it. There's more to it than that. We need to actually transfer fuel. And for, to, for us to do so, it has to be at the right height. Now, we could have just edited the struts, we could have just brought down that sky crane like contraption and made it level with it, but at the end of the day, it's quite unwieldy. So, hence the second iteration of our custom refueler, and in fact, the almost final iteration of our custom refueler, depending on the events of the next episode. This makes much more sense because we are using a rover rather than some weird fuel powered sky crane thing. Benefits of using a rover include enhanced translation across 2D planes, so we can move uh, in quite a nice, you know, quite an accurate, precise movements. And also the fact that we're not burning the very fuel that we're trying to refuel our plane with. That might help. So all in all, this design is a lot more efficient. We just have to make sure that it works, which is what we're doing right now. So we've loaded up again, we've put this over to the side, and we bring our thing round the back, and we just try and put it on top, but for some reason it's not working. We do manage to jump up and get it right over, but having reversed, we see that we've managed to break the docking port in the process. What's wrong here? What have I forgotten? Why isn't it work? Oh, yes. The landing gear are still up. So we'll try this again, having got ourselves a brand new Dave the Custom Refueler. I'm calling him Dave, yes, calm down. Having got ourselves a new one, and this time having closed the landing gear on the plane, we shall proceed to bring our craft over for the second time. And now, because the plane has been lowered down to its appropriate height, it will... Oh, why is it not? Oh, okay, we, we're just slightly at the wrong angle. We will this time manage to bring the docking port directly over and to get a direct docking. Ooh, wunderbar. Sir wunderbar. We have fuel, we have energy generation, we have everything we need. All of the key solutions are now in place. It seems like this design will be perfect. Now you may notice, you may have noticed, may of, may have? I'm from Derbyshire, we get the two mixed up. You may have noticed that there are docking ports sticking out from the side and what happens or at least what they are intended for is for our canisters which we spent so long trying to get onto the surface of lave can actually integrate into this method and we can use them to refuel this plane as well as just the other ssto unfortunately it doesn't quite work because the panels are situated too high on the vehicle and in fact you can see that it's just really not cut out for it i mean we could lower the docking port so that it would be at the right height and we could stick it out further so that the wheels wouldn't be colliding as they are now but recording in the early hours of the morning it didn't seem like this was a priority and so i didn't do it in hindsight i think i probably should have put that little bit extra effort in because it would be useful to have a method of refueling this thing although we do as we shall see later but for now, this is pretty much the end of that. It's quite amusing watching this guy try and dock, but we only have a lim limited amount of time, so we're not going to sit here watching it entirely. What is the next step, Harvey? Well, the next step... Strange voice in my head. The next step is to put this thing onto a rocket and to launch it to the stars, or at least to Jewel. However, first attempt to do so doesn't end quite so well for a few reasons, one of which is that something broke on launch, and so when we eventually get up higher, having detached our boosters and then detaching this extra stage here, which takes an unusually long amount of time to run out, we start to get some wobble. Things start shaking around, I detach the boosters and it takes out two of the pairs, and I emergency break to destroy the other two pairs, leaving ourselves with nothing more than our interplanetary transfer stage. Turns out what happened as we try and land this thing safely, because this is quite a good opportunity actually. We can test whether the parachutes and the method of getting this thing down to the ground will work. 
try and save the nuclear stage, but it doesn't quite happen. So we get this thing down. It turns out what happened was that I built the craft in the VAB too low. You can see here that the engine is actually clipping on the ground. You can see it resting there and slightly wobbling. Now in the previous launch, this engine here actually broke off and detached. However, this time we try it with the exact same setup and it doesn't do that. So although our launch stage is fine, this won't be the final launch that we have to do with this craft. In fact, it'll be the penultimate launch. So we're gonna craft higher, this time it seems to work fine. Detach our boosters in three, two, one, and there they go. Carry on getting higher, detach our second lot of boosters, get up higher, detach our second pair of engines, get up even higher, and detach our last and final, which are the same synonym, our final pair of engines leaving just this one. However, unfortunately at this point I realise one crucial mistake I've made in the VAB, and it's one that I've made a few times before. I built our interplanetary transfer stage, but I didn't connect the actual central tank to the outside engines. Oh, dearie me. I did this before in a previous episode of Space Tourism, and it's caused us a lot of grief on the stream that I was recording this in. However, this time, before things get too far, I do in fact realise. So, launching again, we drop the boosters, we drop the tanks, we drop more boosters. Go on, drop, there you go. And getting up higher, we drop more tanks. And this is the very, you know, quit, cooked, paste thing, you know, mission, vi video editing sequence thing. Damn, my vocabulary is sophisticated. So, we bring this higher. We eventually circularize using this, and you may notice that not only have I added on fuel lines, I've also added on docking ports and RCS tanks to our stage here. Harvey, why have you done this? What's the point? What are you possibly going to be refueling or docking to with this stage? Well, it turns out that on launch, I didn't get a chance to actually show you the footage, but on launch, we are very close to our low carbon orbit space station, which throughout the start of the first series of this show, we actually used fairly often, less often now. But I've been thinking that instead of using up this stage and creating more interplanetary debris by using it to uh, help and assist our craft in getting out to Joule, why don't we keep the leftover fuel from Kerbin Orbit in Kerbin Orbit? And so I launched at the right time to get a window that was very close to being a rendezvous with our LKO space station. And I detached the stage using RCS tanks that I've added on and RCS thrusters, bring it over, and finally dock it to our craft. Now currently the space station is quite symmetrical, it's quite even on all sides, barring that weird sticky out transfer stage there. Which was used, I might add, which was used for our SSTO extra capacity, wasn't it? Oh, I remember that mission. That mission was fantastic. I want to do that again, but I want to make it better and less logical. But anyway, so it is quite symmetrical space station. I don't want to ruin that by leaving this tank here. So we will dock and we will transfer fuel. Uh, the space station actually has an excess of oxidizer because it has been used to refuel that SSTO, which will obviously need more liquid fuel than oxidizer because it uses air-breathing engines, which means that it can get its oxidizer from the atmosphere. So instead of transferring all our fuel, I leave the unnecessary addition of extra oxidizer within this tank, and before it runs completely dry, I also leave a little bit of liquid fuel so that we undock and we start burning retrograde to deorbit it back down into the ocean. A lot less planetary debris. And in fact, you may have noticed, you probably won't have done, but you may have noticed that there has been a lot less debris, in total, in this particular video, because I took the liberty of deleting it all from the tracking station. That may be a bit cheating, but I don't really see how it would be. It's save modification, of course, but it's not affecting our missions. In fact, it helps us significantly by removing the field of air intakes that was bobbing up in the ocean. You couldn't salvage them because they were continually bouncing. They really need to fix that, squad. Please, air intakes should not be nearly as powerful and tough as they are. Anyway, skipping through all the boring interplanetary stuff, we get out to Joule, we burn in the beautiful green horizon. It's no wonder that the Kerbals want to come here on their holidays. The subtle green against the black starry background really is quite enticing, especially for a species that's skin is green. 
Hmm. I have to say, even for a species whose skin is pink, or, I don't know, peachy coloured, I'm looking at my hand right now, kind of peachy coloured, I mean, I'm Caucasian, I'm not, uh, Asian or, what's the other, Af African? So, my skin is quite peach coloured. Where am I going with this? I don't know. It's not racist, it's really not, it's just description of colour. So yeah, even for me, that green colour is quite appealing. I guess the colour of your skin and what colours you like really have nothing in correlation. Oh god, this is, conversation is getting weird. I say conversation, it's just me talking to myself. And when you have no external stimuli other than a video that you've spent two hours editing, thank you very much, KSP, other than the video you've spent two hours editing, it gets a bit weird, as you may have noticed in previous videos. But no matter what, no matter how weird the conversation gets, I do manage to get our craft out to lave. Dave, the custom refueler, will proceed to drop down into the atmosphere. I always add on RCS tanks to our interplanetary stages, in the hope that I can maybe keep them and reuse them later, but realistically we need them in order to land pinpoint on the spot where we want to be. So, as we fall down into the atmosphere, getting deeper and deeper, we will hear the sound of that interplanetary stage exploding. And perhaps we'll even see it. Oh, there it was. Yep, there it was. So goodbye, yet another interplanetary stage. And all that debris there, please do destroy yourselves. We really don't want you cluttering up our, sh our save. There we go. Thank you very, very much. So bringing our craft down... We use the eight or so parachutes, is it eight? Yes, the eight or so parachutes that I've attached onto our buggy. Having spent little time to make sure that they actually keep the craft a level, which is perhaps not what we want because we are landing on a slope. We'd pr probably prefer it to be parallel with the slope, but it seems to be okay. It can land and it doesn't do weird backflips and acrobatics that previous craft have done in the past. Thank God for that. So, what do we do now? Well, of course, it's up to someone to repair the tyres, but who? Jebediah Kerman left the lathe to go open up the new base on Val, which we do actually need to do some work on at some point. I have kind of been delaying that. So, who on earth could be left behind to take over from him? Well, there was a Kerbal standing in the middle of nowhere for some reason, and I was wondering why, until I remembered back to the previous episode when a space plane took off and one Kerbal jumped out to safety. <laughs> This is that Kerbal, New Zell or Noodles or something Kerman. And my Vegas has crashed. Restarting commentary in 3, 2, 1. Crisis successfully averted, Harvey continued to commentate the video. So, Noodle or Noodles Kerman, I'm gonna call them Noodles from now on. Just Noodles, it's quite a nice nickname. Noodles Kerman goes over to our craft and repairs the wheels that inevitably broke on landing on lathe. And having completed his job, we now drive over Dave the Refueler to our plane. Come on, this is just like the simulation, everything is fine, we're on level ground, this should work by all accounts. Come on, if this doesn't work, we're gonna be in some deep, well, it's not gonna be good. So, steadily, if an AI could shake, he would be shaking his pants off. Dave pulls forwards and places the docking ports directly over the thing, and it doesn't quite work. For some reason. This is one of the points where I don't... <sighs> this is one of the points where Kerbal Space Program really annoys me. In that, I am directly over a docking port. It should really be able to dock at this point. Why? I try from different angles, and I try from all sorts of different positions, but to no avail. Nothing I can do using purely Dave the Refueler works. And I say it's KSP's fault, it isn't really. I should have developed some method to perhaps tip the back of the craft up so that the front could come down even further. You can see that it is slightly too high. <sighs> But refueling shouldn't be this hard. Excuse me, refueling really shouldn't be this hard. So, just before I end the video, we shall try one last thing. We shall try to get Noodles Kerman up onto the wing of this plane, and perhaps to jump him up and down on this very long strut. 
Because, you know, force times distance from the pivots, the pivots being roughly where the actual main craft is, we should be able to exhibit quite a lot of force onto this, uh, onto this thing here. We should be able to bend the struts, perhaps. We ought to be able to get it low enough to dock onto the docking port. We ought to be able to do that, but it doesn't quite work. No matter how much time warping, no matter how much physical warping, no matter how much jumping and bouncing and looking rather silly I do, Noodles Kerman has never been able to do anything with his life. No, he's never been able to get this thing to work. And that's it for this episode. We didn't get an awful lot done, but we have proven that Noodles Kerman is slightly incompetent. Not that I'm incompetent, no, of course not. Ha ha ha, no, 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 no. It's purely Noodles' fault. Noodles, I'm looking at you, and he's looking at me. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Space Tourism, and I shall see you all in the next episode.